Welcome to another lecture as part of the Law of Contract 2 course at the University of West Indies Faculty of Law. This lecture is on illegality. Illegal contracts are those contracts that involve some form of illegal act or sometimes an immoral act. These acts need not be criminal in nature. They may be tortious in nature or simply some wrongdoing in the sense of a non-indictable offense. Or they may simply be immoral acts. We'll get into some detail regarding all these types of acts and how they lead to illegal contracts and illegality. Generally, there are two types of illegality. First, there's illegality under common law. And second, there's illegality under statute. Illegality under common law means that at some point there has been a judgment which has deemed certain types of contract to be illegal. There are basically five types of illegality under common law. What they all have in common is that essentially there's a valid contract in the sense that all the essential elements of contract, that means offer, acceptance, consideration, and intention to create legal relations, are present. In other words, the parties who have freedom to contract have come together and formed an otherwise perfectly valid contract. However, the courts step in and declare a contract void and unenforceable, and they do so because they declare it illegal at common law. Essentially what the courts are doing is that they're declaring a contract illegal on the grounds of public policy. We will come back to this point and have a look at a number of examples to illustrate this. The second type of illegal contract is a contract which is illegal under statute. There are two ways in which this can happen. First, there may be a statute which expressly prohibits certain types of contracts. So for instance, there may be a statute that prohibits the sale of certain goods. Hence, any type of contract that involves the sale of those goods would be deemed illegal and void. The second possibility is that a statute or a statutory provision impliedly holds a contract illegal. To find out whether a contract is impliedly illegal, we have to check whether the statute prohibits only certain behavior or whether the statute prohibits both the behavior and any contracts involving the behavior. We'll have a look at some examples in relation to this as well after we look at the examples of illegality under common law. But before we look at these examples, let us just make a few more general points. A contract may be illegal as formed or performed. What does this mean? In a nutshell, when a contract is illegal as formed, it means it was illegal at the time of its formation. In other words, it cannot be performed without incurring the illegality. So where, for instance, a statute prohibits the sale of a certain type of product, it is impossible to ever form a contract that does not incur the illegality if it concerns this product. You simply cannot sell this product without incurring the illegality. So that would be an example of a contract that is illegal as formed. In those cases, the contract is void and no rights flow from the contract. In contrast, the contract may also be illegal as performed. That means it was not necessarily formed as an illegal contract, but due to the way it was carried out, the way it was performed, it became illegal. For instance, because one of the parties engaged in some illegal act while carrying out, while performing the contract. Such contracts are not necessarily void, and in such contracts, the innocent party would usually be entitled to a remedy. 
you may find other terms being used to express this distinction between contracts which are illegal as formed and those which are illegal as performed. For instance, in relation to contracts which are illegal as formed, sometimes we find the term material illegality being used. That is, that the illegality goes to the heart of the contract. It goes to the root of the contract. The contract cannot be performed without the illegality. Where contracts which are illegal as performed are concerned, we sometimes also find the term incidental illegality being used. Incidental in this instance doesn't mean, or doesn't necessarily mean, accidental. Instead, what it means is that the illegality is incidental to the performance of the contract. In other words, the contract could have been performed without the illegality. And so where a contract is illegal as performed, or where the illegality is incidental, the contract remains enforceable, but only by the party who is innocent. That means the party which is not in any way assisted or in any way engaged in the illegal performance. Lastly, as part of this lecture, we will also look at the area of restraint of trade. Contracts in restraint of trade are void, but technically we do not deem them to be illegal. Let's now move on and take a closer look at illegality under common law. This type of illegality concerns contracts which are illegal in common law on the grounds of public policy. There's many different categorizations possible. This is because the courts over hundreds of years have found many different types of contract illegal under common law. However, if we look at all the cases and try and extract some sort of commonality in trying to place these cases into separate categories, we come up with five main categories. The first of these main categories are contracts to commit crimes or torts or fraud. Such contracts are void for illegality under common law. Let's have a look at some cases. The first case, Alan Rescues, is a very old case and from today's perspective might seem a bit silly. But even things like illegality under common law had to start somewhere. What happened in Alan Rescues was that Mr. Allen had hired Mr. Rescues to beat up a third party and he'd offered to pay him an amount of money to do so. Mr. Rescues, in turn, said that he would pay Mr. Allen an amount of money if he did not go ahead and do so. So, in the sense of the essential elements of a contract, offer and acceptance and so on, there was a fully formed contract. But of course, how can the courts enforce a contract between two parties where the intention of the contract is to beat up a third party? And so the courts did not enforce this contract after Mr. Rescues had not gone through with the beating up. In Beresford Royal Insurance, someone committed suicide with the intention of leaving the life insurance funds to his family. However, suicide was illegal. And so the court held that this was an unenforceable contract. Clay and Yates involved the printing of a book. As it turns out, the book contained a libel, and the printer did not go ahead with the contract. It was held that the contract was illegal and unenforceable. In Scott and Brown, Doring, McNabb and Company, there was a false market in shares that was created pursuant to a contract between the parties. By buying shares at an inflated price, the parties thought they could entice other people to come in and buy the shares as well. The contract to buy the shares at a premium with the intention of deceiving the general public 
into thinking there was a real market for these shares was held to be illegal and unenforceable. In Tinsley Milligan, two ladies had bought a house together. However, the house was held only in the name of one lady, Miss Tinsley, as Miss Milligan was claiming social security benefits and she couldn't have claimed those as an owner of a house or part owner of a house. When the two ladies fell out, Miss Tinsley laid claim to the whole house. After all, the title of the house was in her name. Miss Tinsley might have relied on illegality to void the initial contract between herself and Miss Milligan as to splitting the house. And what would have been left was herself with the title deeds to the house. The court held, however, that Miss Milligan had an equitable interest in the house. And so both ladies owned the house equally. It's interesting to know, although not for the purposes of contract law, that obviously Miss Milligan did not come with clean hands, that being one of the equitable maxims. Given that the parties did not have clean hands, it is not entirely obvious how the House of Lords reached its decision, or at least why it did not withhold the remedy to Miss Milligan in this instance. But as I said, that is not so much of concern to us here in contract law, but it is a question that we may consider in property law, or especially in law of equity. The second category of contracts which are illegal under common law are contracts that involve sexual immorality. In Pearson Brooks, the issue was the hire of a carriage. The owner of the carriage knew that it was going to be used for prostitution. This rendered the contract unenforceable because it was for an unlawful purpose. The court held that it didn't really matter whether it was for an immoral or illegal purpose. In any case, the contract was void for illegality under common law. In Herman and Charlesworth, Miss Herman had contracted with Mr. Charlesworth, whereby if he could find her someone who would marry her, she would pay him 250 pounds. She left a deposit, but in the end, there was no one to be married, there was no marriage. Miss Herman tried to recover her deposit court held that the contract between the two was void and unenforceable, hence she was not able to recover. In Upfill and Wright, the plaintiff had let out his apartment to a lady whom he knew to be a mistress of another man. When the rent wasn't paid, the landlord tried to recover. The court held that the contract was illegal under common law because it was for an immoral purpose. Here we see a distinction between a contract that involves a criminal act or potentially criminal act such as prostitution and one where it is merely immoral. Some might ask why the court is judging these matters of morality, but in the end the court voided the contract as a matter of public policy and the court's judgment itself is now the law. The third category of illegality under common law are contracts that promote corruption in public office. In Garforth and Fearon, the parties had made an agreement whereby Fearon would hold a public office. In Garforth and Fearon, parties had reached an agreement whereby Garforth was going to help Fearon to hold a public office, but in return, Fearon would ensure that certain people whom Garforth nominated were appointed, for instance, as deputies. Parkinson and College of Ambulance. Parkinson had been approached by the College of Ambulance and told that if he made a £3,000 donations, he could obtain a knighthood. Parkinson gave the donation but never received the knighthood. This contract too was held to be void and unenforceable.